You there? I don't normally kick people off the piano. He's doing a great job. How many appreciate this worship team? Tell me you love them. Woo, hallelujah. You feel the Holy Ghost in here tonight? Somebody shout, something good is about to happen for me. Do you believe it? Lift every hand. Say it again. Something good is about to happen for me. Woo, glory to God. Man, I went to church this morning, got on a plane, came right back to church, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. How many love the Lord in this church? He is a name I love to hear and I love to sing its worth for it sounds like music in my ears it's the sweetest name on earth if you know this song would you lift your voice with me and say and say oh how I love Gee, please turn this keyboard up for me. Oh, sing oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. It is because he first loved me. Loud as you can, everybody, come on. We're singing, oh, how I love Jesus, and oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, it is because Love me. Come on, sing to me. He's wonderful. Oh, to me. He is so wonderful. And I love him for to me. He is so wonderful. Come on, lift that voice. Oh, to me. Just to know, just to know that he first loved. All right, all over this house. Oh, how I love him. Come on, say. Oh, oh, how I love Jesus. Sing, oh, how I First, come on. It's because he. Oh, come on. It is because he first loved me. If you love him, clap those hands. I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. Oh, glory to God. You know, I was thinking while we were singing that. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Uh, you turn it for good. <laughs> Come on, lift it high. Say, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it. I was thinking, I was sitting on the front row and I was thinking about how God operates and how God works. It's interesting to me that, you know, in the book of Exodus, he led them out of Egypt. And they were on their way to the promised land, but then Pharaoh decided, I'm coming to get them anyway. And their back was against a wall, against the sea. And there was no way through. And Pharaoh said, I'm going to take them now. But all that had to happen was that the Bible says that God's arm went up with Moses' arm. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Listen to this now. And I love it because God didn't just open a way for them. You know something I was thinking about last week that really stirred me up? Every one of them walked through. Two million probably. But when they got to the other side, God didn't shut the sea. He left it open. I said he left it open. Because the sea didn't just open to let them through. To take what the enemy meant for evil. See, the sea stayed open. Because God wasn't done moving. Ooh, I said God wasn't done moving. He left that thing open. I said he left it open. Because he wasn't just opening the sea to free his people. He was opening the sea to swallow up their enemies at the same time. Hey, hallelujah. And see, they thought they had an open highway too. They said, come on, let's get them. He said, come on in, every single one of you. Come on in, make yourself comfortable. And right when God had every last one of them positioned, he just lifted his hand and the waves came crashing down. Every enemy. I said, every enemy swallowed up by the power of God. So I wish you'd lift your hands all over this house because not only is he setting you free this week, but everything that harassed you, everything that tried to destroy you, everything that was working against you is getting ready to be swallowed up to this week in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, lift up a shout of praise. Come on, lift your voice. You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good And you turn it for good Come on, lift it loud tonight You take the enemy meant for evil hey. And you turn it for good And you turn it for good One more time Just a little bit louder You take what the enemy meant for evil you turn it for good and you turn it for good. come on come on oh everybody said you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for you turn it for. come on just the voices give me some hats here say you take for you for these final three months October November December three months of violent increase in the mighty name of Jesus expedited favor in the mighty name of Jesus whatever was sent to destroy you is being destroyed in Jesus mighty name I said it's being destroyed in Jesus mighty name no weapon formed against you can prosper Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. So on the count of three, we're going to give God the biggest shout. Not before the walls fall, not after they fall, but before they fall. Why? That's faith. I said, that's faith. Anybody can shout when they're already down. 
but can you shout when it looks like there's no way out can you shout when the devil's laughing can you shout in the dark knowing the sun is coming are you ready I said are you ready one two one two three shout yes oh whoa the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good hey and you turn it for good oh you sound good come on declare it by faith you take hey and you turn it for good hey and you turn it one more time you take what the enemy meant you take what the and you turn it for good you turn it for good come on every hand lift it high lift it high we're not done worship 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 the name that's above every name who for good victory I'm gonna see you victory for the battle Belongs to you, Lord, and I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. I feel it for the battle. One more time, come on. So I'm gonna see a victory <laughs> for the battle. Cause you take all and you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good come on and you turn it loud as you can one last time say and you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good and you turn it Woo, I can see it turning one more time you take You turn it for good. Sing, oh, it is Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. And yes, it is Jesus. house lift your hands come on sing oh it is Jesus wonderful Jesus and yes it is Jesus in my soul Yeah. Hey. 
know that song. Come on, sing it. Oh, it is Jesus. Shut that out of those soul. Come on, lift your voice. Uh. And yes, it is. Yes. In my soul. Come on. And for. somebody shout this is my night for a blessing for my father comes I feel like saying oh Jesus on the main line tell him what you want oh, Jesus on the main line tell him what you want oh Jesus on the main line tell him what you want you gotta call him up and tell him what you want come on well I said Jesus on the main Tell him what you want, oh Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want, oh Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Why don't you call him up and tell him what you want? Oh, if you need a miracle, tell him what you want. Oh, if you need a miracle, tell him what you want. Oh, if you need a miracle. But tell him what you want. Why don't you call him up and tell him what you want? Come on, clap those hands here. Oh. 
Oh, if you need a miracle, tell him what you want. Oh, if you need a miracle, tell him what you want. Well, if you need a miracle, tell him what you want. Jesus, call him up and tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Oh, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Yeah, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Oh, you call, call him up and tell him what you want. Well, if you need the Holy Ghost, oh, tell him what you want. Well, if you need the Holy Ghost, just tell him what you want. Oh, if you need the Holy Ghost, tell him what you want. Well, Jesus, him up and tell him what you want. If you need salvation, tell him what you want. Oh, if you need salvation, Tell him what you want. Oh, if you need deliverance, tell him what you want. Just call him up and tell him what you want. Come on, clap those hands again here tonight. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Oh, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. You gotta call him up and tell him what you want. Oh, if you need a healing, tell him what you want. Oh, if you need a healing, tell him what you want if you need a healing y'all tell him what you want you gotta call him up and tell him what you want you've got to call him up and tell him what you oh yes you must come on call him up and tell him what you want I even know his phone number. <laughs> Jeremiah 33 3. Call on the Lord. He will answer you and show us great and mighty things, even those things you don't know. Can you say, man? Before you're seated, turn around and tell somebody. Tonight is your night. Tell them. Praise God. Somebody say, tonight's my night. Praise God. Are you happy? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Oh, we love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. I said, thank you, Jesus. You got a little bit too much bass for my voice, brother. Amen. <laughs> Bring me up out of the basement a little. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't get to sleep all afternoon. Amen. <laughs> I love this preacher. God bless Pastor Brian Tomes, Jessica, the girls. We're going to have a time all week. I sent for my backup. And if he's going to be here, he's going to be preaching some of the nights. 
as only he can. But my real backup is my grandson, Teddy. Come here, Ted. His mother sent me a picture. He was digging a hole in the backyard. She said, what are you doing? He said, I'm digging a hole. I'm going to go see grandfather and grandmother. Amen. (laughs) Glory. I understand you're playing baseball now. Huh? I saw you got a big hit. Mm-hmm. Did you get to first base? Mm-hmm. You did. And I see you got your left arm warmed up, ready to go. <laughs> He's got a nice blue baseball glove, a bat. Amen. Is there anything you want to tell the people tonight, something they need to know? Think about it. <laughs> All right, I got you cranked up. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Teddy loves to sing, and he likes to go with Grandfather in the woods. What do we look for? Deers. Deers. (laughs) The four-legged kind. Amen. I tell his, my wife, his grandmother, I say, me and Teddy, we're going looking for deer. I hear you're getting a hunting backpack. Is that right? Get it yet? You're going to bring it up to the house for Thanksgiving? Guess what I saw the other day? A moose. Did you ever see a moose? Oh, it was a big moose. Grandma took a picture of the moose. And if you see a moose, hide behind the tree and pretend you're a stump (laughs) till it goes by. Amen. Do you love these folks? They're nice people, you know. Amen. And you know what else I saw today? A horse. But you can't shoot him. Well, not legitimately. Go back with Grandma. That's all you're going to (laughs) say. Praise God. How many tonight's your first night in this special week of meetings? Let me see your hand. After I cover my eyes so I can see you. There you are. Wow. How about in this section? First night, welcome. Over here. Oh, a lot of folks. This week is going to be a week that we're believing God to release the special faith or the gift of faith that the Holy Spirit has for every one of us. When you begin to operate in faith, It brings your giants down to the size of grasshoppers. Now, unbelief says we're the grasshopper and the enemy is the giant. Mm -hmm. But Caleb and Joshua had a different report. And I want you to know the devil is under your feet. Do you believe that? Thank you so much, drummer. God bless you. Amen. And thank you, son. Amen. In the last few years, you that don't know me, I used to be 362 pounds. Some of the older saints may remember that. I, I get rid of 150, 160 pounds. Now my son's trying to catch up. And I'm not talking about the kind you put on a hamburger either. Amen. But you look good. This first I've seen him since July. And obviously his mother and I, we miss our uh, children, grandchildren. You know, grandchildren expand your love. If you thought you loved your children, well, you have grandchildren. And my daughter is expecting our sixth grandchild. My wife said, make sure you tell them I was 12 when you married me. (laughs) Honey, if I did that, they put me in jail. (laughs) She's 18. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me, please. The Old Testament On your phone, scroll to it. You got to memorize, pull it up. 
Good to see you, sir. Your wife, amen. I remember a lot of you folks. I must have been coming here too much now. Huh? <laughs> Pastor said no. But we're looking forward to this week. Tomorrow night, I believe, will be a special night. I don't know what Ted's preaching on. <laughs> but I feel like we should press him right into service. <laughs> I don't know which night. But one of these nights, I want to share and minister a word that I believe will help us in this area. And that is something that we all deal with. And I want to get you ready. Someone said, which night are you going to do it? I'm not telling you. You go be here every night. But there is a key in the Bible that the Lord has given us that causes us to always triumph through Christ. I don't have a title for it, but if I did, I might call it the triumphant life or the victorious life. I don't know which night, but the Lord promised me something. You write it down. We'll see what God does. He said, that night I will put in the people an anointing to always triumph over every test. Now, scripturally, we know that's so. Paul wrote, thanks be unto God, who always, everybody say always, always. causes us to be triumphant. And I started preaching in 1970 in my father's group that he was a part of, a Pentecostal group. They had what they called young people's meetings. And so I first preached my first message in 1970. Can you believe that? Because I was doing the math before church and the number 50 keeps coming up. We're not talking about McGarrett or Hawaii either. I didn't start doing this yesterday. That first service, Pastor, that I preached, eight people gave their hearts to Christ. Five of them, young men, went away to Bible school while I went back to junior high. And they used to kid me, especially when they got older. They said, you're our spiritual father. How can that be? They're all older than me. But the Lord saved them in that youth conference. Daryl and uh, Murray went away to North Central Bible College. Scott George, several others. Randy Dean went to Southeastern, or excuse me, Western. They went to Bible College, and now most of them are pastoring churches. God's principle is always that you do better than what you're doing right now. Everybody say better, better, better. 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 Say it again. Better, better, better. 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 I told every one of you that we're here this morning, I'm going to show you a Bible law as to why sickness, disease cannot come a second time on those that believe the Bible. But you got to work it. We have to teach people how to not only receive from God, but how to keep what God gives you. When you get saved, it's not God's will for you to lose your salvation. 
Now unto him, the Bible says, that is able, he is able. Let me hear you say, he is able. Now unto him that is able to keep you, keep me, from falling. When you come to Christ, he wants you to go on to know more of him. When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, God wants you to stay filled with the Spirit. Actually, Paul's writing would read, Be being filled. A constant process of the flow of the river of God going through us and working to touch others. God works on us that he can work through us. Can you say amen to that? Once you get healed, you can stay healed. You don't have to lose your healing, lose the anointing, lose your salvation. But the Bible teaches us in Hebrews that for those who were once enlightened with the things of the Spirit, that it is possible that if they turn their back on the Spirit and the anointing, it is impossible for them to be renewed again unto salvation. These things that we're teaching are very sacred, very important that we go on to know the Lord. I always like that verse in Isaiah. Who is this that comes out of Edom with dyed garments from Basra, glorious in his apparel, talking about the Messiah, the Christ that we serve? Keep your eyes on Jesus in this last hour. We don't need less of God. We need more of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Nahum, if you have your Bible, open your phone on. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 9 is a key to staying fully free by the power of God. Put the King James Version up. I don't use the New King James because they left out ten different verses in the translation. Anybody that adds to or takes away from the Word of God, they're on my list that I don't use them. Amen. But the King James, I think the, the New King James, I saw the uh, KG, <laughs> NKGV, it uses the word conspire, but that's not an accurate translation. That's why I wanted to change it. It says, what do you imagine against the Lord? The word there in the Hebrew does not mean that you're working against God, but rather you're questioning your experience with God through the mind. Everybody say, the mind is the battlefield. And so it doesn't mean that you are willfully working against God, but what it speaks of is actually a battle in your mind, the imagination, that if it wins out in that battle, it will tie the hands of God and keep Him from being able to help you, a big difference from the word conspire. Because there are many people, they love the Lord, they serve God, but they still have problems. And it doesn't mean that they're willfully inviting those problems in their life. Are you listening to me? There's a big difference between a hypocrite and somebody that's weak in faith. Somebody that's weak in faith, they try to do good and do what the Bible says. 
But in that desire to do good, they fail. That doesn't make them a hypocrite, but the Bible speaks of they that are weak in the faith. And those that are feeble were to make straight paths for their feet. So it speaks of a walk of faith. But a hypocrite is somebody that knows what is good and pretends to do good while secretly disobeying the word of God. That's a hypocrite. And Jesus said, that's what those Pharisees were. They were hypocrites. They were whitened sepulchers. And they were filled with dead men's bones. Religion without Christ is nothing more than a hypocrisy. It is phony. It's fake. I don't need religion. I need Christ. I need Jesus in his fullness, his strength, and his power. I don't need another denomination. I don't need a church. I need Christ in me who is the hope of glory. If you believe it, clap your hands and say amen. Amen. What do you imagine? So it's talking about the mind. Now, 1 Thessalonians, good to see you again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Paul prays a prayer for the church at Thessalonica. He said, and I pray God, the very God of peace, that he might sanctify you wholly. That speaks of separation. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're daily being crucified, that flesh, that we might know him by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the flesh wars against the things of the Spirit. And if we're going to gain the upper hand, we've got to renew our mind and put on the mind of Christ. And the only way you can do that is through the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If it can be rightly divided, it can be wrongly interpreted. But John chapter 16, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead and guide you into all truth, A-double-L. Everybody say, all means all. And so we can trust the Holy Spirit to lead us perfectly. Hallelujah. Well, my grandson and I go in the woods. The first time, he was about two, going on three. I said, Teddy, I'm going to show you what a deer track looks like. And he's walking down the road. It was cold. He had his, he had his uh, skull cap on, woolen hat. And I had a stick. I'm part Irish. We call him a shillelagh, but a walking stick. I broke it off a, a dead tree, carved it with my knife, sanded it a little bit. And I was using it. First thing, he don't care about deer tracks. He said, Grandfather, I need a stick. I need a stick. So we're walking along the path going into the deeper part of the woods. He said, here's my stick. But when he went to lift it, it was heavier than he was. A lot of times in life, you're taking a hold of something that's even bigger than what you are right now. We need to learn how to get our mind in agreement with the Word of God. Paul said, and I pray God, the very God of peace, that he might sanctify you wholly. Everybody say, God wants me whole. Whole. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Whole. It's a wonderful thing to have peace of mind. It's a wonderful thing to have strength in your body. Two and a half years ago, I fell and busted my knee. I wasn't sick, but I couldn't walk. And the longer I laid there, the more my muscles atrophied. Until when the therapist came, she said, now I'm going to stand you up. You're going to start walking today. Praise the Lord. I've been waiting for that. She put me, I was sitting on the couch, and she turned around to get a walker. Boom, I fell back down. I didn't even have the strength to sit up on that couch. She said, what happened? I, I'm laying there. I, I, I can't sit up. And so my wife comes, and my daughter comes, and I got three women 
trying to get me to stand up. Now, I know the verse in Isaiah where it says seven women will take a hold of one man. Amen. I was waiting for four more girls to come in that living room. But my wife was on one side. The therapist, she's on the other. And my daughter's following with some kind of a, a seat with wheels on it. Come on, Dad, you can do it. And they wanted me to walk from the couch to the doorway, which was less than 10 feet. I mean the first step, and I'm wobbling. The second step, I'm about to go down. I got two women holding me and my daughter behind me to catch me with a chair. I made it to the door. I went back to the couch. They turned and went into the kitchen to get something, and I fell over and slept for 10 hours. It wore me out because my body needed to recover in the natural. Same thing is true in the supernatural. You come under an attack. The devil attacks your mind. The devil will try to attack your body. And you feel it in your spirit, man. You feel it perhaps in your body. You sense the oppression in your mind. And you say, there's no way that I can have a turnaround. But the Bible says, what do you imagine against the Lord? If God said he's going to help you, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm going to be with you until the end of the world. You can count on God. You may not be able to lift the stick. It's too heavy but you have a God that when you're yoked with him he said my yoke is easy and my burden is light I don't know how he's going to do it I don't know where he's going to do it I don't know when he's going to do it but God is a delivering God he'll lift you out of the thing that the devil meant for your destruction and set your feet on a rock and you shall not be moved come on clap your hands and shout hallelujah hallelujah Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm, say this, I'm not going anywhere. What do you imagine against the Lord? Dealing with a Bible law of healing. The mind is the battlefield. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and if you'll look at your notes, I was starting to touch on this last year. So I remember my place. Amen. But it's like feeding cattle. You don't give them the whole wagon load of hay. You give them a bale. Amen. I'm not done with this thought, but it needs to be in us. Oh, hallelujah. And I pray God, the very God of peace, that he might preserve you blameless, sanctify you holy, Spirit, soul, and body. Everybody say spirit, soul, and body. Say spirit, soul, and body. How does God enact that Holy Spirit of power to do that that Paul prayed? Where it is so effective, it touches your spirit. Touches your soul and touches your body. How does God do that? And I'm dealing with a Bible law of healing. If we can understand this, then we can receive it. You can't receive what you don't know is available. Years ago, I used to work with an evangelist, R.W. Shambach, for many, many years, almost 25 years. Ran around this country preaching, singing, praising God. But in Chicago at the time, the mayor, his name was Daly. Not the son, but the dad. And a bank in Chicago published a list of names in the Chicago Tribune of people that had money that was owed to them, that was left by people that had died, and the money was in one of the premier banks in Chicago and they wanted the people to come and claim their money. Brother Shambach, he, he had the paper, he went down the list. Anything that sounded like his name, Shamrock, Sham, Shucklebuck, whatever he could find. Check my name. Well, I'm not on there. 
But there was a reporter at the Tribune that did an article. There was a man on that list that was owed between three and five million dollars. And he never showed up. So the reporter took the name of the man that was owed the most money and went out to see if he could find that man. Are you kidding me? I'd be down there getting my name changed at the courthouse. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> and in Southside Chicago off Racine Avenue, they found the man. And his buddy had come to him, said, they're looking for you. The police? No. Not the police. The bank. He said, I don't owe anything. So he was getting ready to go into hiding, and his buddy brought him the Chicago Tribune, said, look, this is your name. They owe you over $3 million. He said, that's not me. That's not me. Nobody in my family had money. Nobody had anything. That's not me. And his buddy got so aggravated, he went down to the Chicago Tribune and he told him, he's still alive. Here's his name. And he was able to get his social security number, gave it to him. They said, that's the guy. Well, he don't believe it's his money. So the Chicago Tribune got a hold of Mayor Daly. Mayor, there's a guy, he's on the tax rolls, taking welfare from the city and the state. And he won't come get his money. You want to move a politician? Tell him there's money available to them. Mayor Daly got his limousine, true story, and drove down to Southside Chicago, down past Racine Avenue, to the man's apartment. Knocked on the door. The man opened up. Is that you, Mayor? <laughs> mayor said, get in that limousine. And the mayor made him get in the limousine. Drove him down to the bank. They checked his social security number. And he was the man that the three million plus interest was owed to. Mayor said, first thing I'm going to do is cut your welfare checks off. <laughs> we all know the second thing, taxing. But anyhow, the man had millions of dollars, but because he didn't have the proper knowledge, he could not enjoy what was his. Many Christians are the same way. When it comes to healing, the power of the Holy Spirit, because they've not read God's newspaper, I'm talking about the Bible, they don't know what belongs to them. But I come here this week, I don't have a limousine, but I'm coming anyhow. And I'm going to tell you, get in the car, come down to the altar, and get everything that belongs to you, and stop letting the devil steal your blessing. But you're going to leave here thanking God that he made a way when you didn't even know he was making a way. You have an inheritance. Can you shout amen? Something that belongs to you. It belongs to your spirit. It belongs to your soul. It belongs to your body. What do you imagine against the Lord? I don't know what your battle is. You don't know what mine is. But God, who knows everything, promised us, I will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. When you have Jesus as your focus, you should be able to walk through life at perfect peace with the things of God. Recently in our nation, there's been quite a stir. A lot of fear, a lot of misinformation. People are afraid. 
But when you know your God, fear cannot take a hold of you. Are you listening to me? Oh, hallelujah. Those that know their God shall do exploits. God's getting ready to use you in a greater measure than you've ever been used before and the devil knows it and he's trying to shut your blessing off and let you live in the south side with no money but God's getting ready to promote you to the place you belong are you listening to me it is yours it belongs to you God has a blessing with your name on it and the devil is a liar he got to take his hands off my blessing he's got to loose everything that belongs to me and God has some That'll bless you in your spirit. It'll bless you in your soul. It'll bless you in your body. Come on, shout hallelujah. You're blessed. You're blessed going in. You're blessed coming out. Everything you set your hand to, it is blessed. Oh, hallelujah. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the country. Your basket is blessed. Your storehouse is blessed. Your seed is blessed. For God, who is God, is a blessing you. Come on, clap your hands and shout. Now, Nahum said, what do you imagine? That's your mind. Paul said, you're a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions. What do you imagine? So the battle there is in the soul. Now God gave us nine gifts of the Spirit. Nine gifts to help us be preserved, blameless. That means without anything that is a spot or a blemish or a wrinkle that the devil would try to put in your life, God said, I'm going to preserve you blameless. You'll not have any spot. You'll not have any wrinkle. You'll not have any blemish. You girls, when you get up, you look at that face and you start working on it. And I see a couple of you men. I think maybe you're doing it too. I was preaching in Dallas, Texas. And this fellow come up to me. He said, Brother Shuttlesworth, have you ever considered permanent eyeliner? I said, you can go sit on that side of the auditorium. (laughs) But don't hang around me. But it's all right. You're making yourself... Look your best. God doesn't mind that. Because spiritually, by the Spirit, that's what He's doing in our spirit, which He renews daily. In our mind or soul, our minds are being renewed by the Word of God. And in our bodies, which He quickens by that self-same Spirit. The nine gifts of the Spirit are for your spirit, your soul, your body. The three gifts that speak to the spirit of a man are tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, but what is it? I pray in the spirit. It came out of his spirit. Then, with understanding, it came to the mind. The link is, you've got to activate your spirit with the anointing of the Holy Spirit tonight and all this week. If you feel like praying in tongues, just start. I don't care if I'm preaching, somebody's singing, somebody's running. If you feel the anointing come on you, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost because God is revealing something in your spirit. Eventually it'll be understanding, Paul said, in your mind. But what is it first? I will pray in the spirit. Then I will pray with understanding. Three of the gifts are for your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions. Those gifts are the revelation gifts, discerning of spirits, the word of knowledge, and the word of wisdom. The Bible says, desire earnestly the best gifts. Well, obviously, the best gift is the one you need at that moment. But there is an order to the Holy Spirit. That we can set our faith and covet earnestly 
the best gifts. Desire the things of the Spirit or desire spiritual gifts. Are you still listening to me? Three gifts are for our mind. They're revelation. Where we get a fragment of the mind of God at a given moment that will help us to not be blemished by a plan or an attack of the devil against your precious life. Three of the gifts are for your body. The gift of faith, working of miracles. The gift or gifts of healing or healings, plural. Those are for your body. The nine gifts of the Spirit are for the working of God in you that you might not have any blemish, any spot, or any such thing. When Nahum spoke of what do you imagine against God, he was showing us the key to receiving from God begins in the mind. Secondly, Nahum said, he will make an utter end. God will bring things to a conclusion. Years ago, after Korea, when some of our men came back from fighting in the Korean War, they found that the Chinese had implemented brainwashing with some of our captured soldiers. And so our government began to study how does brainwashing work? How were they able to break the will of our soldiers down? And the summation of that they found was by constantly changing, I'll use this, this is my words, not the armies, but by constantly changing the goal and moving the goalpost so that they could never make a mental conclusion to the matter. It brought confusion. Are you hearing me? One day, if you do this, you'll be all right. The next day, that won't work. Here's something else. And so our soldiers, bless their heart, were constantly being brainwashed, but could not find a conclusion to the situation they were in. Does it sound familiar to you? Evil men, Paul said to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 13, evil men shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. These gifts keep us from the deception of the devil. And we put on the mind of Christ. If God said it's over, it's over. When Jesus was on the cross, my friend, and he finished that great redemptive work, he said, tetelestai. They write it in the original. It means it is finished. That's what the devil doesn't want you to know, that the attack of the enemy that he's bringing against you, he was already defeated on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And I come to Fitchburg to tell you it is finished. It is over. God is the champion. Your elder brother Jesus destroyed the devil on the cross over 2,000 years ago. And Paul said... He's under your feet. And Christ is now seated at the right hand of God in heaven where we rule and we reign with him. And the power of the Holy Ghost is what is making us what we're supposed to be. Lastly, Nahum prophesied. Affliction. Everybody shout affliction. Affliction. Shall not arise a second time in your flesh. When you serve God, He not only can bring a conclusion to what's challenging you, but He stands there like a traffic cop and declares, Devil, you can't come across that median strip again. It's over. The second time is spiritual. In your Bible, every time you read about the second time, everybody do this, like two. It means that's where the anointing is. For example, when Elijah knew that he was going to go to heaven and Elisha followed him across the river of Jordan, he said, I want twice as much as what you got, man. Elijah said, what would you say, Elisha? 
I want a double portion of your spirit. Everybody say twice. He wanted twice as much. I can see Elijah stop. Look at him. It's all right. Let me tell you something, brother, dude. (laughs) You want twice as much? You have to see me with your eyeballs, with your eyes, when God carries me away. That speaks of vision. To receive more from God, we have to have a heavenly vision that says I'm going to get more than what I have now. Thank God for what my daddy had. Thank God for what my mama had. But I made up my mind I'm going to go a little deeper. I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to get more than I've ever had before. And the devil cannot limit your blessing. He has no power to keep you from the conclusion of the matter that God is working in your life. Whether it's your body, whether it's your mind, whether it's your spirit. He sent the Holy Ghost and he wouldn't have sent the Holy Ghost ghost unless we needed him suddenly oh my lord chariots chariots of fire come down out of heaven Elijah said you watching Elisha he probably was like a cow looking at a new gate You that never had a farm don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) If he had any cataracts, they got burned out. He's looking into the glory. Elijah takes off. Elisha's there. Hey, I get the double portion. (laughs) But not yet. I'm not even going to say soon. (laughs) When suddenly, like a bird floating in the air, comes the mantle of Elijah. And Elisha snatches it up. He comes back to the river of Jordan. What does he say? The God of Elijah. Smack! He hits the water. And the waters roll back for Elisha. Elijah performed eight miracles in your Bible. Elisha, 16. You tell me, did he get twice as much? Everybody say the second time is spiritual. The first Saul, the king that Israel demanded... He ended up dying a suicidal death. Fell on his sword. Boom, he's gone. But the second Saul met Jesus on the road. He gets born again and then writes two-thirds of the New Testament. Everybody say the second time is spiritual. The first Saul died like a fool. But the last Saul who became Paul, he became a fool for Christ. Amen. Years ago in New York City in Brooklyn, down by Katz's Deli, there was a guy that had a sandwich board he wore. And he'd walk up and down the street. And on the front it said, I'm a fool for Christ. And everybody said, he's a fool. But when he walked by on the other side of the sign, it said, whose fool are you? Are you listening to me? I choose to be a fool for Christ. I made up my mind I'm going to serve him all the days of my life. The second time is spiritual. God's not done blessing you. God God's not done using you. God's not done anointing you. You're moving into your second spiritual touch from heaven. Can you shout? Yes. It's getting stronger and stronger on the earth. Hallelujah. Everybody say the second time is spiritual. This affliction, a Bible law of healing, shall not. Arise a second time. I remember on the news a few weeks ago, this little fella, he kept saying, there's a second wave coming. 
It'll be here around the first week of September. First week came and went. Second week came and went. I got so mad, I said to my wife, she, she has to turn the TV off. I jumped up. I said, look, you little moron, it's not coming a second time. And you got to love my wife. She said, come on, come in. I'll fix you a sandwich. It'll be all right. Are you hearing me? And then last week they announced, not only is everything flattened, but in all 50 states there was only 111 people in ICUs with COVID-like symptoms, but not COVID. Hey, it's over, you moron. But I knew it was that day. Because I said, honey, I know a verse. Where God says, it's not coming back a second time. I had to go back in and preach to him. I don't know if he heard me or not. Don't care. See, the problem is not the world. The problem is the church. We're not standing on the word and our world is being damned because of ignorance in the church. But I refuse. See, I'm an old time American. Amen. I thought John Wayne was a prophet till I was 18. I didn't know. (laughs) Now think of this. Nahum, how am I doing for time? Aren't you glad you're going to preach tomorrow night, Ted? Amen. Your mother and I are going golfing. But anyhow, no. I, I, I don't golf. I think I heard him say goofing, but I don't know. I'm going to stay over here. I feel safe right now. Everybody say the second time is spiritual. In your Bible, always the second time is spiritual. There are three gifts that are for your body. Three gifts for your soul or your mind, your will, your intellect. Three gifts for your spirit. Thank God he's working in you. God's not done with you. You can have faith to know that God is on your side to help you. And you can't lose for winning. Now let's look at this. As I close, someone says, what does that mean? Absolutely nothing, but I'm circling the, the runway. God said this was a law before the cross. Before Jesus died on the cross. Before he shed his blood. Before he took the stripes upon his back. All Nahum had was the covenant that God made with Moses at the bitter waters of Merah, when God said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. When God said that, that's all Nahum had. But it was enough for him to say, affliction is not coming a second time. In fact, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy, if you keep his commandments and do his precepts, keep his word, None of these diseases shall come upon you. That was the Old Testament. But then the cross. Everybody say the second time. Jesus died on the cross. When he did, he destroyed every work of the devil, including sickness and disease. So that the writer of Hebrews says, Now we have a better testament and better promises. Stronger. Everybody say stronger. stronger. Do like this. Say stronger. stronger. Then lift your hand and say, Lord, make me stronger by the word. Make me stronger by the Holy Spirit. Make me strong in the name of Jesus. Don't let anybody work against me. But Father, if they do, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Do you believe that tonight? Now, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the first, everybody say the first. The first first Adam was of the earth, earthy. He represented this world. 
I don't have time to get into it. But Adam, the Bible says, Romans, he was not deceived, but he willfully, purposely sold us out. Eve was deceived. The Bible says Adam was not. And through one man's disobedience, sin and death. And what is sickness? If it's not healed, it's incipient death. It'll kill you. Through one man's disobedience, sin and death entered into the world. Then Paul wrote, but the second, everybody say the second. Say the second time spiritual. The last Adam, he is a quickening spirit. Where the first Adam sold you out, the last Adam, he bought you back off the auction block of the devil. So the second time sin cannot rise back up in your soul, in your spirit, or even sickness or disease in your body. The Bible says even in the Old Testament, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. God's going to keep his hand on you no matter what your age, no matter where you live, no matter where you go. He is a God that keeps covenant with his children. Come on, shout hallelujah he is a powerful God he is a mighty God he is a delivering God everybody say the second time is spiritual Woo-wee. I love this hallelujah hallelujah in your Bible is the story of a man called Job God brags on him. Have you considered my servant Steve? I mean, Joel? <laughs> There's none like him on the earth, you devil. Ah! The devil says, Does Job fear God for nothing? You have built a hedge around him. Lift your hands and say, I'm under the blood, divine protection. I love this story. I'm a dad. I have son, daughter. I have grandchildren. Oh, that hair looks nice. Lord, impart right now. <laughs> he looks good. Teddy, you need to pray for grandfather. I'm asking God to give you a hair restoration ministry. Amen. <laughs> Glory. Now think about this. The devil knew that Job was protected by God. There are some things the enemy knows about your relationship with God. Now this is the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Christ had not yet died. The devil says to God, and this was last year on Thursday, uh, Friday night I dealt with this, but I wasn't finished. Amen. The devil said, put your hand on him and he'll curse you. What did God say to Satan? Everything he has is in your hand. Why? Because when the first Adam sold out, dominion went to Satan. And God could not intervene. If he did, that would make God unjust. And God always worked by legal redemptive power. There had to be a price paid. There had to be a sacrifice. And Jesus was God's answer to the devil. Fire comes down out of heaven. The accusers later say to Job, oh, you must have ticked God off. Burned up his animals, his real estate, his children die. His wife says, Job! Curse God and die. Now, don't get mad at me. Job said it. You talk like a foolish woman. I've met one once years ago. And Job is sitting there scraping his flesh. 
You talk like a foolish woman. Meanwhile, he has affliction. Boils come out of corruption in the blood. Job needed better blood. Job 3, the third chapter, Job said, The thing which I have greatly feared is come upon me. Fear will open the door for the devil to attack you. Are you listening to me? He said, The thing which I feared. You know what I tell people? If that's true, I'm afraid I'm going to be a multimillionaire. Fear opens the door. Ecclesiastes. Whosoever breaks a hedge, a serpent bites him. The devil knew Job had a hedge. But the only way the devil could fasten his fangs into Job, the hedge had to be broken. How was the hedge broken? The thing which he feared came on him. If you get into fear, you remove yourself from God's protection. Are you hearing me? When I first went as a missionary to India, 1981, I was preaching in Puli and Gudi. When I flew in, Mother Teresa and the other nun was with her. Nice little lady. They were of the Austrian order. They weren't Roman Catholic. They were an order from Austria. And she had a place downtown Calcutta off of Royd Street where she cared for the poor. The man I preached for, his name was Mark Buntain. He built a hospital across the street. In those days, Jimmy Swaggart gave him the money. And they built a beautiful hospital to take care of the sick, the disease, those that were dying. And as a young man, I got to go there and preach. And they gave me an assignment to go preach in the province Tamil Nadu in a little village called Puliangudi. And we rented a cow pasture. Before the service at night, we picked up all the cow patties. Because church folks don't care to sit where the cows have already sat. My interpreter, his name, we called him Brother Ezekiel. He said, Brother Shuttlesworth. And I was younger then. I was 34 years old. They're going to bring lepers that are contagious tonight. This was in 1981. But it's all right, we've built cages for them. I said, cages? When I got to the crusade field, they took these tall posts and had sunk them in the ground. And they took barbed wire, strung it around the wood, and put all the lepers in the cage. When I saw that, something in me didn't like that. We claim that we have power to heal the sick. We're sticking them in cages. I'm going somewhere. You're either going to shout or say, oh, ouch. (laughs) Why do you think the devil wanted the church to shut down? We know how to heal the sick. Very smart virus. It didn't work in bars or riots, just churches. (laughs) Obviously, it was a non-church going virus. It worked really well in Democratic states. But Republican states, it, it didn't get a stronghold. Let me tell you something. If you're still blind to what's going on, Come through the line tonight and I'll dump all the oil on your head. 
They want the church to shut up and shut down. Ten years ago, I had a man tell me in politics, he said, there's a plan to shut every church down in America. I laughed at him till this year. And I watched people begin to cave to pressure. Shame by something that's not even as bad as other things we've had to deal with. There's more going on than you realize. Thank God your governor finally got with it Friday. Moved what? Most of the state into the final phase, number four, except for two areas. Boston. If they ate more beans, they'd be doing better. <laughs> Springfield. I think one other place. But friends, I'm telling you, God brings these things to an utter end. Either he's telling the truth or God's a liar. But God can't lie. Finally, man has to recognize God is supreme. And it shall not rise up a second time. What a year it's been. Murder hornets are coming. So I said, what are you going to do, Brother Shuttlesworth? I said, I'll show you. One hornet down, one more to go. Then did you see what they were saying last week? There's an asteroid right before election day. I wonder who paid the asteroid off. Amen. Don't be stupid. Let God give you the mind of Christ. It's the mind. The battlefield is what are you imagining. Are you hearing me? So I'm standing there outside, pulling and goody, and I'm feeling bad for these lepers. You can see them pressing their face against the barbed wire. They want to be with the people. They can't be. So Brother Ezekiel, my interpreter, says, what do you want to do? I said, go unlock the cage. Oh, Brother Ted. I said, unlock it. But they are contagious. I said, I've been waiting for this. When I was in Bible school, they taught us what Jesus said. Heal the sick. Cast out devils. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. I said, I've checked off two of those things. And tonight I'm going to check off the third. I'm going to cleanse the leper. I paid good money in Bible school to learn to do that. Are you listening to me? I'm trying to tell you what is it that the devil is trying to put in your mind that seems greater than your God. I'm telling you, our God is great all by himself. He is great when you wake up. He's great through the day. He's great when you go to bed at night. He'll be great when you wake up again tomorrow. Your God is a great God. There is nothing on this earth, in this universe, that is greater than the power of Almighty God. He is God all by Himself. And I laid hands on every one of those men. So I said, weren't you afraid? The only thing that bothered me when I was in India, I couldn't find a McDonald's. They worship cows there. You change their religion, there was enough beef to feed the whole nation for 10 years. But that was their mother walking out there. Mom? Mom. She's still mad at me. Then I went to Pennsylvania when I got back. I didn't know he died, but a man died on the left side of the auditorium. You were with us. The nurse was getting ready to call the ambulance. I thought he fell asleep. I went over and jerked on him. I said, hey, wake up in here. I'm preaching. He came to and the nurse flaked out. She told us after the service, he was dead for five minutes. I was wondering how I was going to get an ambulance and get him out of here. I'm telling you, you can check off on your list everything that God says you can do. Don't be intimidated by a lying devil that tells you you're nobody. Jesus came to tell you, you are somebody. You have the great anointing of Jesus Christ in your heart. You are a man after God. You're a woman after God. The devil is afraid that the church will rise up and put him under their feet. Woo! (laughs) 
Whoever breaks a hedge, a serpent bites him. Hear me. The power of God is here tonight. What is it you want the Lord to do for you? What is it you need? Who came out of nowhere? You need the Lord to do. Glory. Think of this. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is the last. He's a quickening spirit. Everybody say the second time is spiritual. God delivers Job. And then what does it say in the last chapter? And God gave him twice as much as what he had. When Job was on that pottery shard, that little hill, he said, oh, that I would have somebody to stand betwixt or between me and you, O God. The word there means umpire. Put your hand on God. Put your hand on the problem. And God represents you. He was really looking for Jesus. Because right after that he said, I know my Redeemer lives. Do you know him? I said, do you know him? Do you know your Redeemer lives? And that in the latter day he shall stand. Oh, that my words were written, written with a pen, an iron pen engraven in a rock. My Redeemer lives. That word Redeemer means in the Hebrew, J-O-L, has four meanings. Number one, he is my real estate. What's the first thing the devil did? He tried to burn up his real estate. But his Redeemer could restore the second time and give him land back. The next thing, he is my kinsman Redeemer. That means he'll He'll give you your family back. He'll work in your family like Boaz did for Ruth and Naomi. God has a field with a blessing with your name on it. He's your kinsman redeemer. He is my vindicator. Somebody shout, he's my vindicator. Oh, hallelujah. I know my redeemer lives. Now Jesus goes to the cross. And they took and fashioned a crown of thorns and pressed it down on his brow. Those thorns of Bible days came from what was called the acacia tree. If you look in your uh, Bible concordance, or Ungers, Unger's Bible Dictionary and Geography, the acacia tree was common to the land of us, where Job was from. I don't think that they picked the thorns by accident. Where Job's hedge was broken, where they would, the Africans use the word boma, where they use thorns and build hedges to protect them from the lions where those same acacia trees of Job's day, I don't think it was an accident that they picked that for the crown of thorns. And anybody that understands knows Jesus was saying, I'm closing the protective wall that the devil would try to get through to destroy you. Now, those crown of thorns speak of the finished work of of Jesus Christ. He wore those thorns. The blood streamed down. Teddy knows this. I used to preach it. If we were uh, forensic experts, we'd trace the blood. The first blood that was shed. The crown of thorns. As that blood began to run down, speaks of the authority of God. When they took the beard and smote his face, 
and beat his back. And the blood began to stream from his flesh and from his back. That speaks of the sacrifice of the blood. When they drove the nails into his hands and feet and put a spear in his side and blood and water gushed out. Track the blood, friend. When God needed to make a human race, he took a rib out of the side of Adam and made a brand new race. But when God wanted to make a born again race, he took the blood out of the side of Jesus. God. Hallelujah. And we have been born again. Come on, jump on your feet and praise God. 